Oh, because it's not it's not focused on anything, right? And that's by design. Let me call it aspects of gauge gravity duality and holography. So So the structure of these lectures is dynamical in the sense that um, we will interact with you for several weeks, and we will see. I will see what material is better to include in lectures and what material is better to cut out. And of course, your feedback will be uh, quite crucial on that because it's a quite a it's quite a um, uh, vast topic and. Obviously, that certain things you might like, and certain things you you don't like, and certain things are more relevant and less relevant, and so on. So it will be dynamical interaction. But what I plan to tell you about is so it will be some introduction today, where I will try to convince you that uh, it is actually useful to study. Uh, gauge string duality or gauge gravity duality and holography is useful from a point of view of trying to understand what is happening in nature, not just for the beauty of the subject. We'll develop a number of holographic tools. And then we'll build something which is known as holographic dictionary. And then there will be some applications of holography. So let me call it holography. And fluid dynamics. And uh, perhaps finally we'll talk about holography and condensed matter physics. So, um, not to break my neck here. So let's start with the introduction. So why do we need so what is the goal? Why do we need to study to study these exotic things? Also exotic. So the goal is to understand strongly interacting quantum systems in and out of equilibrium. And this, is, this goal is motivated by a number of experiments. The most well-known experiments that uh, we will discuss are the experiments which are conducted at RIC, Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider in Brookhaven, and LHC on colliding heavy ions. So heavy ions, so typically, so typically it would be lead-lead collisions or gold-gold collisions, and maybe proton. Uh, lead and, and so on. So, so heavy ion, meaning ions of these elements. So the temperatures, 
so this, uh, the, these collisions are, of course, we know that in principle, so nuclear physics is supposed to be described by QCD, and it is described by QCD for all we know. Uh, as a result of this collision, uh, we have the state of matter, so nuclear matter described by QCD at finite temperature and density. And finite temperature and, uh, uh, means that one has to put it in Kelvin, so you can estimate uh, what, is, what is the temperature there, and the temperature is quite high. In Kelvins, it's of the order of 10 to the 12 Kelvin. And we can talk about these collisions in some, in some length and, and also some, some physical parameters that we would like to uh, calculate from first principles, for example, in QCD, if we want to understand what is happening uh, during these collisions and uh, how to describe them. But there is another extreme. So this temperature is quite high. But then there are also experiments with so-called cold atoms. And um, cold atoms, or even ultra-cold atomic gases. And here we have so, uh, something like so lithium-6, for example. So here the temperatures are very small. So go as small as 10 to minus 8 Kelvin. But surprisingly, the quantum systems, quantum many-body systems that appear in experiments at very high temperature trick and LHC, and these quantum systems that appear at very low temperatures, they share certain features, and we would like to understand these features. And these features have something to do with, with strong coupling. So that's, that, that, will be, that will be the main, the main theme of our discussions. So common features can be listed, namely that these systems are, first of all, these are many body systems, and when I say many body, then there is some way to talk about the number of participants, and I will comment on this later on. Of course, if you have a relativistic system, that it doesn't make sense to talk about the number of particles involved, because particles can be born, particles can uh, convert energy into mass all the time, and so on. But, but in a certain sense, it would, be, it would be possible to talk about the number of participants, because, for example, if you have a heavy ion collision, what happens is that, so you have this very complicated quantum mechanical or quantum field theory, field theory, field theory process, field theoretic process. But in the end, what happens? So there is a fireball after the collision. This fireball expands very rapidly. It hadronizes, and you have detectors around this uh, line of collision in your accelerator. And these detectors will count the number of hadrons that result after the disintegration of this fireball. And uh, the number of hadrons can be counted, so it will be it can be it can be made sort of a real-time process in the sense that you can you can actually event by event you can analyze the characteristics of these final hadrons, the momenta, the direction of um, uh, in which they fly, and so on. And in that sense, this n refers to not to the number of participants inside this fireball, but the number of the final participants in, in the hadron gas. For non-relativistic systems, the situation is much easier because in non-relativistic systems, of course, you can count the particles. In non-relativistic quantum mechanics, right, there is no conversion between energy and particles. So you can actually say that the number of these, of these cold atoms in this experiment is of the order of 10,000. You can count them. So, but the common feature is that it's a many-body system. It's not one-body, two-body, three-body system, which you can, you, can, you can try to solve exactly or approximately, right? You need, you need to use statistical physics or thermodynamics arguments and kinetic theory arguments in order to deal with, with these systems. 
Now, these systems are quantum in the sense that the uh, De Broglie wavelength exceeds much larger or of the order of some characteristic scale L, where L, if we are dealing with, again, non-relativistic systems, then L is nothing but the volume over the number of participants in non-relativistic case to power one cube, or one, one, one third. Or for systems which are relativistic and, and still were, so let's say, relativistic with, with kinetic regime, then L can be taken to be of the order of L min three path. When, so a little remark that not all systems will have a kinetic regime. And in fact, the ones that appear in the context of a gauge string duality at strong coupling, at infinitely strong coupling, they actually don't have a kinetic regime. And then you may wonder what, what kind of L enters there? And it's an interesting question that you, we will will probably try to will probably try to address in this in this part of the of the lectures. So yeah, the mini body quantum, and they are strongly interacting. And again, in every case, this, this means um, uh, something very concrete. So for example, if we are talking about the uh, heavy ion physics, then you can, you can look at the alpha strong, QCD, at the characteristic scale, for example, at temperatures or energies, which can be achieved by this rig collision, and you can simply Convince yourself that, that alpha strong is something which is not very different from one. It could be less than one, but not, not much. So you cannot expect, well, you may expect your perturbative tools to work, but, but you, have to be, you have to be warned, of course, that, that your coupling constant is, is not a small number. Or if you're dealing with holographic models, such as n equals four superant males, Then uh, the appropriate coupling in that case will be g squared young mills times the number of colors. And the strong coupling simply means uh, this coupling is, this, this lambda is much greater than one. Now, finally, so this is one, two, three. And then property number four is, or feature number four is that these systems are in local thermodynamic equilibrium. Equilibrium. And uh, that, that can, be, can be quantified by, by saying that the uh, length scale of variations in, for example, temperature is much larger than L min three path. And um, again, you may question correctly, what do you mean? So all this terminology, once I say words min three path and min three time, all this terminology implicitly refers to the kinetic theory. And uh, in kinetic theory, as you probably know, when you describe the non-equilibrium processes, so typically what you, what you have to compute, uh, if you have a kinetic regime in your theory, you are using Boltzmann equation of loss of equation or the BBJKY chain, I mean, for, for, for people who are sort of, who want to, uh, to get sort of more rigor into that because Boltzmann equation was derived phenomenologically, but 
as you might know, it can be also derived rigorously from the so-called Bogolubov chain and equations of motion, which, which are derivable from uh, quantum statistical mechanics. But all that assume, assumes that, that the system in question is sufficiently dilute. And um, there are situations in which this is not the case, in particular in QCD, in this uh, heavy ion collision uh, situation, this is not the case. And so whenever I, I refer to mean free path and mean free time, uh, you have to kind of take this with a grain of salt. And I only mention this simply because we don't have the appropriate language yet to describe it more generally, namely to, to introduce certain quantities that would replace mean free time and mean free path in the, in the, in the current sort of theoretical discourse. These quantities do arise in, in, in holographic approach to, uh, to systems at finite temperature and density. They arise as, for example, uh, the uh, convergence radii of the, um, uh, for, for, your, uh, for your hydrodynamic or fluid dynamic expansion. And um, uh, that is an interesting and open question. But uh, again, so we use, this, uh, we use this terminology from kinetic theory simply because kinetic theory is very well, very well researched and very well understood. Not, not because we uh, have basically no choice but to refer to all, all we know. Now, so what do we need to, so suppose, suppose we, want to, uh, we want to describe what happens in these in this heavy ion collisions, and why do we need holography for that, and uh, why, why, why string theory has to, be, has to be employed to answer these questions? So let's look at what, is, what, what we know. So for example, So this evolution of this, let me call this RIC LHC fireball. So it evolves in time. So we need both thermodynamics and transport. Or sometimes it's referred to as kinetics. But again, I, I warn you from, from the start that we are dealing with situations where kinetic theory will not apply. So, so this is just a terminology. Right? So we need transport properties to describe the behavior of the system out of equilibrium. Right? So thermodynamics refers to situation in full equilibrium, there's no time, everything was cooked up already, so we have a soup which is completely ready. And we measure various quantities of this soup, the density, the equation of state. Uh, you can compute, once you know free energy, you can compute everything in, uh, from of thermodynamics of this, of this system. But it's not enough to describe what is happening here, because what is happening here is you collide with science the system first thermalizes very rapidly, and that is the process that has to be described, has to be understood. How you take a quantum system, which is a, which is a, a system which evolves according to unitary evolution laws and so on, and how to describe the approach to uh, thermal equilibrium in this, in this system, right? and quantitatively. And how do you do this in QCD, which is a, a strongly interacting theory, and, the energies which are relevant for RIC and LHC. So this is question number one. Then suppose that the system reaches the local thermodynamic equilibrium. Then it evolves, right? Because this fireball, then you then you have these collisions, right? So suppose you have this. Um, so suppose the axis along which the ion ions are moving is from the board towards you, or vice versa, and this is a cartoon of such an ion. You can immediately tell me that, in fact, various ions have different shapes. In particular, if you take the ions of uranium or some other uh, atoms, they will not look like, like spheres. And that, that's, that's a very relevant 
uh, point, but let's not <coughs> discuss it now. So, so you have you have one ion going from from U towards the board, and then another ion from the board towards U. They overlap. The collision typically is non-central, so it means that there is some region where they overlap, and this is the region where we have this quark gluon plasma. This quark gluon plasma expands. When it expands, it is it's thermalized. It expands. When it expands, it is uh, not strictly speaking in global thermal equilibrium, obviously, right? So suppose you, you have air in this room, right? And uh, you can think of what happens if the walls of this room are uh, starting to expand. I mean, they can expand adiabatically, right? Moving away, right? Or they can expand very quickly, right? If they expand very quickly, your gas in this room will not be, obviously, in, in thermodynamic equilibrium. Depending on the rate of this expansion, you may or may not have uh, the situation where you have to apply uh, the, the rules of non-equilibrium statistical physics. So, so this is this is the non-equilibrium part, and this is equilibrium part. So let's see first what what we know about the equilibrium part. So let's say, what do we know about thermodynamics of QCD? Of QCD. Right. Well, as I said, once you compute the free energy of a certain system, your favorite quantum system, for example, harmonic oscillator at finite temperature, density, the size, right? Uh, if you have the grand canonical ensemble, then what you compute is something which is uh, often called the omega potential. It's a free energy in the grand canonical ensemble. I'm not sure about the, the canonical terminology, but let me call, let me call uh, this uh, this potential omega. So this is a log, uh, apart from minus temperature, of a partition function, uh, QCD. And uh, this is a function which depends on temperature and the baryonic chemical potential, mu b. But, of course, there are some parameters which are hidden here. Namely, it's not just the temperature and the chemical potential mu b. It's also lambda QCD, which is sitting inside the partition function, right? Because this is a this can be written as a Feynman integral and uh, as, a, as, a, as a yeah, it's, it's in the uh, Feynman integral presentation. And and uh, I mean, all these parameters of QCD are sitting there. You cannot you cannot escape them. So masses of quarks, for example, and number of colors and and, and things like that. Okay, so it is a function, and uh, you can compute from from this function using the standard the standard thermodynamics, you can compute equation of state. So let me remind you that, okay, so omega is the energy minus T times the entropy minus mu times the appropriate conserved charge. And this is the same as free energy minus mu Q. So with the standard thermodynamic formulas, like this. Um, you compute pressure, which is minus d omega over dv at t and mu fixed, and you compute the entropy, which is minus d omega over dt with volume and mu fixed, and so on. And uh, that, in principle, if you knew this partition function completely, that would result in something which is known as a phase diagram. Of course, for QCD, it's known only approximately. And moreover, it's known mostly from the latest calculations. But the cartoon, so this is a cartoon. It's not, so let me, you can, you can look at various references. So later on, I will give you a number of references for where all these things. And I remind you, so all we are talking about now is, is the introduction. So I'm, I'm just trying to motivate what we are going to do quantitatively with, with ideas CFT. So, <clears throat> uh, so the cartoon, the cartoon of the phase diagram, is approximately looks falling. So there is a critical point. There is, uh, oh, let's say, people believe there is a critical point, right? So some, so this goes like this. Then there are nuclei, nuclear matter, and then so this is zero. 
So the bottom, uh, the thing is that the, the phase diagram roughly divides, and then there is some, there is some exotic stuff, there are some exotic faces at, at large mu, uh, so typically referred to as CFL and so on, so we'll not even discuss that. Uh, our main concern is the transition, and here it is a crossover for small sufficient to small mu. It is actually a crossover between quark gluon plasma and hadrons. So this is what Lettice tells us, and this phase diagram depends, depends very crucially, so it depends, depends on NC and masses of quarks. So uh, there are two important plots. So this is a cartoon. Now I'll try to be a little bit more, more precise. So there are two important plots. Uh, two important plots. One of them is uh, uh, mostly coming from lattice. So this is all coming from lattice QCD. So plot number one is, is pressure uh, versus temperature. And um, uh, for, for QCD, right? And, and, and this plot, this is something that is useful to know. So let me, let me normalize pressure. in the following way, Oops. this is zero, this is T over Tc, and this is one. So, so here, what I, so before, before uh, drawing this thing, so here the, uh, the result for the Stefan Boltzmann, so pressure is, uh, so let me write this down and then I comment on that, so it's eight pi squared, Yeah, very convenient. Uh, over 45, and here we have 1 plus 21 over 32 times uh, number of flavors times t to the fourth plus corrections, which go as m squared times temperature squared for massive quarks that we have in the system. All right, so, so this, is, this is ideal gas. So this thing is ideal gas of quarks and, and gluons. Now, so the, 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 the computation of this pressure in the ideal gas is something that you um, in principle, you 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 should know how to do, right? So, so take take your standard statistical mechanics distributions, was Einstein or Fermi Dirac, and uh, compute. You can compute various thermodynamic quantities such as the free energy, and 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 so on. And in particular, there is a pressure. And this computation is. No different from basically from the computation for the black body radiation. So I think in standard courses in statistical physics, usually this is done. So you compute the the uh, you compute the uh, the uh, energy density and uh, uh, entropy and so on of the black body radiation. And of course, if you have relativistic stuff, relativistic stuff, you could have electrons, right, which are ultra relativistic. So you can neglect mass in comparison to momentum. And if they are non-interacting, this is approximation, right? If they are non-interacting, then you treat them as effectively as black body radiation, except that, of course, if they are fermions, you have to use the Fermi-Dirac statistics rather than Bose-Einstein. But this calculation is something that typically uh, people do in statistical physics courses. So, the, uh, so you, can, you can do it as an exercise, and various coefficients which come, come up front here uh, simply... Uh, count the degrees of freedom. So if you have gluons, for example, right, so obviously you have, you have polarizations of the gluon, right, and then, then uh, in addition to polarization, you have also number of colors and, and so on and so forth. Right? So, 
will be these pieces. Now, uh, just as a remark, but we will probably uh, we might also discuss this later in in, in some detail. Uh, the same expression for uh, for pressure, and of course you can compute corrections. I mean, it's not. I just write it. All of this is known. It's not. It's not something that's just. Uh, it's 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 fairly straightforward to to, to compute. Uh, it can be also computed. So it can be computed in uh, just taking the standard black body kind of radiation in statistical physics. Uh, of course, with relativistic motion now, right? So you you have when you when you write down your dispersion relation. For your particles, um, something like this, right? And where uh, in the approximation, so for uh, mc squared, which is uh, much less than than uh, pc, right? You neglect. So this is ultra relativistic motion. So with this dispersion relation, you can compute. This thing, but you can also compute. You can also get the same result from quantum field theory at finite temperature by computing in one loop uh, expression for the effective potential, and that's another incarnation of the same result. And it is useful in the sense that if you want to, of course, this is all at zero coupling, right? This is ideal gas and non-interacting, non-interacting particles. In principle, what you want to do, for example, in your favorite. Uh, lambda phi to the four theory, or or in, in QCD, is to compute the corrections at small coupling. Uh, you're trying to do this perturbatively, right? So uh, then you may question the kind of sensibility of this approach because you you know very well that in QCD the coupling is a function of energy. So if you're expanding a small coupling, the question is you know, what kind of processes you have in mind because obviously. Uh, the, the result will depend. I mean, your coupling will depend on the on the energy of these. But, for example, if you are at ultra high temperature, so suppose the temperature is extremely extremely high, then uh, it is a fair uh, uh, a fair approximation that your gas will be effectively non-interacting gas of ultra relativistic particles of quarks and gluons. Maybe with small corrections that you can compute in principle using perturbation theory. Like one loop corrections that I just mentioned. All right. So this is Stefan Boltzmann. So the plot that I'm about to about to draw is to um, is the dependence coming from lattice QCD of the pressure in QCD normalized by the Stefan Boltzmann pressure, this one, uh, uh, as a function of temperature normalized by some critical temperature TC, which I will introduce shortly. And uh, we know one thing, that, that P is equal to P, Stefan Boltzmann, at ultra high temperatures. It's extremely high energies, right? So we know that, OK, we have this asymptotic freedom and so on and so forth. So we know that at ultra high temperatures, this is the ideal, essentially the ideal gas of quarks and gluons. And therefore, this plot will actually approach asymptotically. It is supposed to approach the, is supposed to approach 1 at T over Tc very large. And indeed, it does. Now, so the plots. So let me let me try to let me try to draw it. So it's it's a curve, which some people. Okay, so let me try to. So a curve of this type with a certain transition in between. And uh, let me call. So let me put one here. Namely, T equal to Tc. So this Tc is from lattice calculations on Tcd. It's approximately 170 MeV. So it shows that uh, the behavior of thermodynamic parameters such as pressure in your system of quarks and gluons changes uh, from low temperature to high temperature. And of course, you can notice that the transition occurs at temperatures which are of the order of lambda QCD. So it's not probably very surprising. So this is a manifestation 
of this transition from the gas of hadrons to the to the system of quarks and 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 gluons, and you can see here that it is a crossover. It's not a phase transition, right? So it's a smooth curve. There's nothing like it's nothing like this, right? And uh, there are different scenarios depending. So I, I remind you that this is coming from lattice QCD. In lattice QCD, you can you can um, you can do various things to your uh, ingredients. And as I said, all of this depends on on parameters such as MQ, the number of flavors, and so on and so forth. So you can you can read in literature what kind of transition it will be and how TC depends on these parameters. But in in real QCD. We expect this to be a crossover at around 170 MeV, this transition. Now, RIC and LHC operate at, so they operate at T over TC. In the range from two to four. <clears throat> so, on this plot, you can think about them as operating somewhere in the vicinity of one, not very far. Whereas The result for ideal gas, right? So this deviation from uh, from from one, which is negligible, occurs at t over t c of the order of one thousand. So in this region, we can reliably say, so if t over t c is approximately a thousand, we can say more or less reliably that our Ideal gas calculation has something to do with reality, so we can actually. An interesting observation, and this is <clears throat> nothing but the observation, is that the value. So you may you may ask, all right. So so this is a cartoon, but but okay. So how far? So if you go from the Stefan Boltzmann limit to the to the area here where where Rick and LHC operate. What is the deviation of your actual pressure in at those temperatures from the from the ideal gas result? Is it order of magnitude? Is it five orders of magnitude? Is it one percent, two percent? Right. So that's that's a sensible question to ask, and the answer is known. And the answer is that uh, the ratio. Of P of pressure to P Stefan Boltzmann at temperatures which are of the order of rig temperature is approximately 0.75 or 2.8. Okay. So the conclusion is that this is not far from ideal gas. And you may you may want to you may want to understand this from theoretical point of view by doing computations in perturbative QCD, by doing various resummation of your Feynman diagrams at finite temperature. There is a machinery which was developed uh, from early 1980s to how to do that, and to understand this result, namely why, in principle, a priori we don't know how this curve would behave, but it turns out that it doesn't behave too badly. So we have this this result. Now, one very important uh, remark is that this type of behavior does not work for transport coefficients. So this does not. Work for 
transport, and therefore for non-equilibrium and other so there's a variety of non-equilibrium uh, parameters that you want to that you want to calculate, but in particular it doesn't work for viscosity and and other parameters <coughs> due to Let me, due to strong dependence, strong dependence on coupling. Right? So if you want, this is, uh, this is one of the, so it sounds perhaps simple, but um, uh, keep in mind that this is, probably one of the main philosophical conclusions out of this uh, heavy, iron, uh, heavy iron program uh, so far, plus the applications of ADS-CFT, plus applications of string theory to, to this business, right? So it turns out that, that for equilibrium properties, which are thermodynamic properties, the uh, weak coupling approximation is not so bad for intermediate coupling, and therefore you can extrapolate this your perturbative results in the middle of this intermediate coupling region. But if you naively try to argue that, okay, it was, it was fine for pressure, it should be fine also for viscosity, then you fail miserably because that is simply not the case. The transport coefficients and viscosity in particular depend very strongly on coupling. So that was, that, that was a discovery, if you want, both experimental one and also theoretical. And uh, the idea of this, uh, of this course is to um, tell you how to compute uh, these uh, quantities, the transport coefficients, from dual uh, gravity, dual gravitational background, using holographic tools, using ideas safety correspondence. So that you could do this calculation yourself and and convince yourself that indeed, indeed the statement is, is correct. So let me finally show another plot which will be also of some importance. And the second important plot will be the one of conformal anomaly. Or that's maybe the highbrow terminology for this. So this is epsilon minus three times pressure normalized by t to the fourth versus the ratio t over tc. So uh, let me remind you that you have the stress energy tensor, the expectation value of stress energy tensor at finite temperature and density in the rest frame of your fluid or gas. Then it looks like this. This is Pascal's law. It should be familiar uh, to you. So the T00 component is the energy density of your system. And then you have pressure. But remember what T menu is, right? T menu effectively is the tensor of of, um, uh, of uh, shear pressure and direct pressure, right? So it, 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 calcul it cal calculates what is the for what force your gas in the room acts on various surfaces. So for example, uh, <laughs> the surface here, right? and then various shear action, right? So uh, how these particles, they bombard this, the surface in various directions and how to calculate this, the, the averaged uh, force per unit area acting on various surfaces. So in the rest frame of the gas or fluid, it simply tells you that this pressure is isotropic in all directions, this is Pascal's law, unless you make the system anisotropic by some external conditions. So you can have charged system, you apply external field, for example, then yes, so all particles suddenly want to bombard this wall, not this wall, right? I mean, that's, you, can, you, can, you can cook up some anis anisotropy in your system. But <clears throat> unless you do that, then, then then the T menu is this one. So a simple exercise for, for you to, uh, yeah, for those of you who haven't seen this, so 
you know, do the Lorentz transformation in, uh, with some velocity for velocity u mu. And, and write down what t mu is in the arbitrary frame, which is moving relative to the rest frame with some uh, velocity u mu. So of course, you recover the standard expression for, for t mu that you see from cosmology and, and other, other, other things, relativistic t mu. Okay? But that's not what we, what we want to do. So uh, for t much greater than t c, right, uh, we have our ideal guess. And for ideal gas, the equation of state is epsilon equal to 3p. So, so this plot will have zero at the far end. And indeed, again, so the lattice QCD data, t over tc, zero. Indeed, it goes to zero at high temperatures, as it should, because because of this equation of state. But in the middle, it does something interesting. It has this maximum, and then it goes to zero. So this is the approximate, approximate plot. So, but also, this is also true, also true for conformal field theory at any coupling. So this is also this is true not only for ideal gas but also for conformal theory at any coupling, and indeed, um, it's uh, easy to see because CFT at non-zero temperature now equal to zero temperature because in conformal field theory is a theory with no scale. If you have CFT at finite temperature, then temperature is the only scale. is the only scale, and uh, that means, so for example, e.g. in d-dimensional d -dimensional conformal field theory, you can write down entropy density entropy density, which is the entropy divided by the d minus one dimensional spatial volume it is some constant a, then there is a function of the coupling, let's call this coupling lambda, and then by dimensional analysis, it must be proportional to t to power d minus one. So this is a coupling constant. Coupling constant. And um, this means that um, uh, you, can, uh, you can compute, so, so uh, you can compute other other quantities, so for example, we can compute the, uh, so, so entropy is dp over dt at fixed mu, and so this allows you to compute pressure, which is one over d times a f of lambda times t to power d. And also remember that, that free energy is minus PV, so from that, you can compute, so from this, you compute the energy density of Ts minus P. So let me finish this calculation and I will stop. Yeah. Right, so, so, so this means, so this simple uh, thermodynamics uh, calculation tells you that the energy density is D minus one divided by d times the same parameters a, f of lambda, and t to power d. And you can compare the two sides and you see that this is d minus one times pressure. So again, so this is, uh, there, there, is there is nothing which goes into that, into that computation, but, the, uh, but the, the statement that we're dealing with the conformal field theory with no internal scale, therefore, by dimension analysis, the only scale that can appear at finite temperature and zero chemical potential here is temperature itself. The rest, the rest is simply uh, uh, manipulation with thermodynamic formulas. Now, also for, for CFT, we expect the 
trace of the stressor energy tensor vanishing. And if you compute the trace of <coughs> this object, right, so you have to raise one index. So this means trace of the minus epsilon PPP and <coughs> supposed to be equal to zero and therefore epsilon equal to D minus one pressure. So this is equation of state. And in particular, so this, from this it follows that the speed of sound squared, which is dp over d epsilon, this is one over d minus one. So the last thing that I want to say today is that, uh, of course, so this is, this is a very, uh, it's a very simple theory. In real theories, uh, which have something to do with nature, <clears throat> so in theories, with internal scales, one or many, for example, lambda QCD, but not only, even if you introduce chemical potential in the game, it's already two scales, right, T and mu, and things may depend on the ratio of T and mu, and that, that makes this analysis far more complicated. Um, the result, so the theories of internal scales is G lambda QCD, <coughs> the result is more complicated Namely, you can write down the entropy density, again, on dimensional grounds to be proportional to some energy scale to <coughs> power d minus one, but, but there is a function now, unknown function, that will, um, that will depend on the ratio of your internal scale, such as lambda and temperature. And of course, you, in principle, the goal is to calculate this function uh, theoretically uh, from the first principles, the only thing that you know is that F goes to one at very high temperature, because then we recover the ideal gas, but otherwise this function remains unknown. But uh, to the last, uh, last uh, sentence is probably the following, that even for simplest case of conformal field theories, where the, uh, the dependence on the dimension full quantities is trivial, namely this one, <coughs> The dependence on a coupling constant may be extremely non-trivial because there is this function f of lambda sitting in front and this f of lambda, of course, you can calculate it in perturbation theory for weak lambda and that, that is a rather non-trivial thing to do in at finite temperature. You have to resum uh, various graphs and that's, that's machinery for that. But then that strong coupling, it may be uh, a function which is completely unknown and in um, uh, in uh, theories like QCD, you can compute it from you can compute it from from lattice, for example. But <coughs> uh, in general, this is a non-trivial. So only in few cases, f of lambda is known uh, is known um, is known pretty well on both sides, like for small lambda and and, and for infinite large lambda. And ADS-CFT or holography is a tool to calculate this f of lambda at least for a number of models where you can build a uh, string theory dual to your quantum field theory. All right, so amazingly, yeah, so that was, that was an introduction. That was an introduction and perhaps it was not as quantitative as you, as you, uh, as you would like to, to see, but um, in the future what, what we are going to do is to quantitatively move through construction of a specific of a specific uh, set of tools that would allow you to compute these quantities, it, the transport and, and thermodynamics of a particular class of quantum field theories where you can actually build the uh, gravity dual. All right, so we'll start doing this tomorrow. All right, All right. Uh, if you have any questions, so uh, you can 
ask at any time. I don't know. You can find me in some office. It's 272, I think. Yeah, so down the corridor. Anyway, so feel free to, to interact with me as much as you want. <laughs>